Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Tushar Patel from the Mayo Clinic in Florida, and I just want to welcome all of you to this session on epidemiology from a global perspective. As we all recognize, cholangiocarcinoma knows uh, no borders and affects people across the entire globe. But we also recognize that there are people who are at a higher risk, and there are also some places in the world that do have a higher risk. And understanding some of the reasons why this might be the case is, is very important if we're going to improve on our ability to prevent or to reduce the risk of, of getting cholangiocarcinoma, or even if we want to become better at detecting and diagnosing it early enough to be able to cure it. So in this session, we'll have presentations from two outstanding individuals uh, who will provide us with a perspective on the epidemiology uh, of cholangiocarcinoma. And it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce our first uh, presenter, Dr. Juan Well from the uh, Christie in Manchester in the United Kingdom, uh, who will provide us with a perspective from Europe. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Juan Valle. I'm a medical oncologist at the University of Manchester and the Christie in Manchester, UK. I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference to, uh, for the invitation to come and discuss the European perspective uh, with respect to epidemiology uh, of cholangiocarcinoma. These are my disclosures, and I guess the most important disclosure is that I'm not an epidemiologist. Uh, this is very much a clinician's perspective in terms of how things uh, are developing in Europe. So this paper has been published uh, within the last month uh, in Nature Reviews Gastroenterology and Hepatology, and it highlights the uh, incidence and annual mortality rates for cholangiocarcinoma across the world. I've highlighted the European countries and you can see there is fairly granular data uh, for uh, each of the countries. But I think most impressive is that the um, annual mortality rates are much higher in certain parts of the world, including Asia, as you will have heard in the previous uh, lecture. Back in 2019, Bertuccio and colleagues uh, described the age standardized mortality rates for cholangiocarcinoma, both intrahepatic and extrahepatic. They looked at the global trends in mortality between 1995 and 2016. What I've done is I've extracted the data for the countries in Europe and I've separated out uh, men in the top, uh, women in the bottom, and you can see here the death rate per 100,000 person years. A number of themes came through. For intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, in the early 2000s, the mortality rates were consistently below one per 100,000. Over time, and the mo most recent data is up to 2014, this rate had increased and was consistently between one to two per 100,000 person years in most European countries for men. We could also see that women have a general lower mortality rate as shown uh, in the figures uh, right across all the different, different countries. These are the data for extrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinoma. Um, so again, a few key messages. In the early 2000s, the mortality rates were lower than intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, ranging between 0 0.5 and 0 0.9 um, per 100,000 population. The rates, in fact, decreased in most, most countries by 2010 and 2014. And just to give you a comparison, in Japan, the rate for women is 1.4, which is about five times higher than the average for women in Europe. The next slide uh, shows the trends over time. Uh, this is for um, men. Uh, on the left, you have intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. On the right, extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And the um, data is shown for 2002 and in five year gaps, 2007 and 2012. And you can see here that the rate has increased in men, highest in uh, Norway. Uh, the only exception to that rule was uh, Finland. And in addition, for extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, you can see that the rates largely uh, decreased with the largest rates again uh, being in countries uh, like Norway. If we look at the data for women, uh, you can see this is very similar um, that the, um, the rate for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma uh, increased and the rates for extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma uh, 
uh, decreased in very similar proportions. If we look at the individual countries, and these are all set out uh, side by side, you can see here the trends uh, across um, 2000, 2005, 10, and 15. And you can see that there is a gradual upward trend seen in most countries. Each of the curves shows data for both men and women. So I think the key message for uh, Collinger carcinoma uh, is that there does appear to be an increase. This is specific to intrahepatic uh, Collinger carcinoma. But then the question is, how reliable is the data? Well, this, of course, depends on data uh, that's retrieved from death certification in the various country registries. So it's important to understand that there is a caveat on the quality of the data that's entered to the quality that's then delivered. Another point is the misclassification between hepatocellular carcinoma and intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Just to highlight this, we know that, for example, in patients with cirrhosis, uh, if a large liver tumor is seen, there are radiological criteria to classify this as a hepatocellular carcinoma. As time has gone by and therapies have emerged, which have mandated the need for biopsies, we have in fact seen that some of the patients who were thought to have uh, HCC uh, once they'd had a biopsy, were indeed found to have had uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. We know from very recent papers that, in fact, the risk factors for HCC and cholangiocarcinoma uh, are very similar, and they include uh, cirrhosis as a risk factor. We also know from data here in the UK that the deaths from liver cancer have tripled in the last 20 years, and amongst 62,000 cases that were seen between 1997 and 2016, 38% of patients, in fact, had an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. In addition, 14% were unspecified, and some of those may also have been intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. The other thing about the data is it tells us very little about the mixed tumor. So we know that some patients have a mixed hepatocellular carcinoma and intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And again, with biopsies, we are seeing more of these patients uh, coming forward. But one of the main things about reliability of the data has been the changing encoding for cholangiocarcinoma. So in attempts to standardize the data, in fact, a lot of confusion has developed. Just to remind you, we've got anatomically described various sites of cholangiocarcinoma. So we've got intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and then we've got distal extrahepatic, which is fairly self-explanatory. But in the middle, we have the perihylar tumors, and I think this is where there's been a lot of confusion. Firstly, they've been called different things. So historically, they were called Klaskin tumors, hyla, perihylar cholangiocarcinoma, so there hasn't been a standardization of the name. Moreover, the International Classification of Diseases, or ICD-10, does have a code for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and for extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, but it did not have a code for a perihylar uh, cholangiocarcinoma. So if you do see a, a tumor at the hilum, where do you put them? In the liver or outside the liver? We also know that the ICDO for oncology codes uh, have a morphology code for perihylar cholangiocarcinoma, but sometimes it cross-references this to intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and sometimes extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. To add to the confusion, the ICD and the ICDO codes do change every few years. And just to quickly show you what the impact of that is. So if we look at these trends in age standardized incidence of uh, cholangiocarcinoma, you can see in blue are the intrahepatic bile ducts, in red are the extrahepatic bile ducts. ICDO2 then classified patients with perihylar tumors to have intrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinoma. So you can see here that the rates go up and switch over uh, once that's been implemented. However, in the next version of ICD, ICD-03, this is reversed and patients with perihylar tumors are now considered to have extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So you can see here that the numbers completely change. Uh, 
This doesn't mean the incidence has suddenly changed, it just means that the classification has changed and we need to know how to interpret the data depending on which version we're using. However, there is hope. Uh, future classification is standardizing this, so the new ICD-11 classification does include specific codes for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, but also for hyalur cholangiocarcinoma, and this is separate to adenocarcinoma of the biliary tract in the distal bile duct and separate to adenocarcinoma of the gallbladder. So hopefully going forward, the data will become more reliable and we will know exactly where patients with hyalur cholangiocarcinoma sit. The other thing with respect to the data is potential for misclassification of cancer of unknown primary. And one of the things that we're thinking at the moment uh, is whether uh, patients with cholangiocarcinoma are actually being misdiagnosed. And I want to take the example of the NICE document. This is the National Institute for Clinical and Care Excellence um, in the UK, which have produced guidelines for management of patients with uh, cancer of unknown primary. We know when managing cancer of unknown primary that there are specific groups of patients. So for example, if patients have um, neck nodes and a biopsy shows a squamous cell carcinoma involving these nodes, then those patients should largely be treated according to head and neck protocols and be managed by the appropriate multidisciplinary team or MDT. In patients who have got adenocarcinoma involving the axillary nodes, those patients should be managed according to breast cancer protocols through the breast multidisciplinary team. Equally, patients with squamous cell carcinoma involving the groin should go to a specialist team, sometimes it's urology team, sometimes it's a pelvic team, but again, they've been identified as a clear group who requires specific therapy. So what about the liver? Well, if there is disease in the liver, there is a mention in the NICE guidance that we should consider that an apparent metastasis could be an unusual primary tumor, by which we mean possibly a cholangiocarcinoma. So um, this is effectively what clinicians will see. These are two CT scans from two separate patients uh, showing the liver. And you can see here that there is disease in the liver on the left, which is a relatively large lesion. On the right, you see a number of small lesions in keeping with liver metastases. We know from a study published in 2013 that in fact, if you take patients with unknown primary cancer and undertake um, RT-PCR and do some sequencing, uh, in fact, about one in five, 21% of patients will have uh, what appears to be a biliary tract cancer in origin. So against that background, we did a project at our institution called Needle in a Haystack. One of our medical students participated in this and looked at sequential patients with cancer of unknown primary between the dates shown just over a two year period. We identified 162 patients who had been discussed at the multidisciplinary team and after removing duplicates had 150 patients. The mean age was 67 years. Um, there was a predominance for female patients, but importantly, about three quarters of the patients were certainly fit enough to have some treatment. What we then did, we took the 150 patients and excluded patients who didn't have any disease in the liver, because then by definition, they didn't have an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And that left us with 47 patients who had either liver-only disease or disease in the liver and elsewhere. And we then classified the patients into two groups, uh, patients who had a pattern of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and a pattern of metastases. The pattern of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma uh, is given by a hypodense dominant liver lesion with peripheral rim enhancement, capsular retraction and hepatic atrophy. And what we found was that 18 out of the 47 patients fitted a pattern of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, which in fact was 12% of all patients with cancer of unknown primary. So potentially these patients were being misclassified. 
This has previously been documented by our late colleague, Dr. Saha, who looked at patients with uh, cancer of unknown primary and looked at the patients with histologies in keeping with cholangiocarcinoma. Now, this was published some years ago, but if you look at a very recent review, new rising entities in cancer of unknown primary, is there a real therapeutic benefit? There is, in fact, no mention of cholangiocarcinoma. So this highlights that much work is yet to be done. And what we're hoping uh, in the UK is that we can identify these patients. And this is important because there are new targeted treatment options available. And moreover, for some patients with localized yet inoperable disease, we may think about other local regional treatment options that allow us then to be able to focus the treatment if the diagnosis is correct. So what we're hoping to do in the UK is to add a different group of patients to the cancer of unknown primary pathway, something along the lines of in patients with a liver dominant lesion, consider cholangiocarcinoma and refer to a specialist team. The take home messages are that the incidence of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is increasing in Europe. Conversely, extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma incidence appears to be decreasing. The accuracy of data relies on correct death certification, differentiation between cholangiocarcinoma and hepatocellular carcinoma, identification of patients who do have the mixed entity, and standardization of perihyla classification, particularly with the new ICD-11. And it is important to consider intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma as a diagnosis when considering patients with cancer of unknown primary. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I'll be presenting on the epidemiology of cholangiocarcinoma in the United States. I do not have any disclosures. As most of you already know, cholangiocarcinoma is the most common biliary tract cancer. In the United States, cholangiocarcinoma accounts for anywhere between 2 to 3% of all cancer-related deaths in the U.S. Incidence of cholangiocarcinoma is higher in American men than women. Incidence is also higher in Asian Americans and Hispanic individuals. Overall, five-year mortality is below 10%. Mortality is specifically poor for African Americans, followed by American Indians and Native Americans and Hispanic individuals. In general, cholangiocarcinoma is classified into three main subgroups, as you heard previously. You have the intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, the perihyla cholangiocarcinoma, and the distal cholangiocarcinoma. Because cholangio is a very rare malignancy, usually the perihyla and the distal malignancies are combined into one group and are called extrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinoma. And then we compare extrahepatic cholangio with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. In terms of proportion, perihyla has the highest proportion of presentation. In the United States, it's anywhere between 50 to 60 percent of all cholangiocarcinomas diagnosed in the U.S., followed by the distal subtype, which has anywhere between 20 to 30 percent. Intrahepatic is the least common uh, cholangiocarcinoma seen in the U.S., but it is the second most common type of liver malignancy. The main point here is that these three subtypes are distinct entities. They have distinct epidemiology. The pathobiology of the disease is distinct. Clinical presentation and management is distinct. And then outcomes are also distinct. And so they should be considered different diseases. Now I want to review historical trends of cholangiocarcinoma incidence in the United States. Early studies, as mentioned by the previous speaker, early studies were uh, confounded by misclassification of uh, clad skin which is sometimes known as perihyla or hyla tumors. And when you look at um, between 1973 to 1991 in the United States, we, that was a period between the ICD-1 uh, code, the International Classification for Diseases for Oncology version one. And during this period, there was no specific code for clad skin or perihyla malignancy. So investigators literally have to decide whether they put them together with extrahepatic malignancies or put them together with intrahepatic. So that was left to investigators to decide. Then around uh, 1992 is when the ICD version two was introduced. 
And here, there were histolog histologic codes that can be referenced to intrahepatic malignancies. So what most investigators did here then was to cross-reference cl uh, skin malignancy with intrahepatic cholangio uh, cancer. Then around 2000 is when the World Health Organization introduced their classification of tumor. And with this, class skin was included as part of extrahepatic malignancy. United States adopted the ICD version three uh, right around uh, 2001. And going from there, all extrahepatic malignancies in most studies were put together. Uh, all class skin malignancies in most studies were put together with uh, extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So as you can see the trend, we went from where there was no distinct code for a class skin and investigators have to decide where they put them to where most investigators cross-reference cross class skin malignancies with intrahepatic. And then during this latter period, uh, it is cross-referenced with extrahepatic cholangioma malignancy. And this is what the latter period is what most experts believe is the appropriate way of classifying class skin malignancy. The main point here is that because of the changing in the coding system, it has made it really difficult to actually track the trend of cholangiocarcinoma any part in the world, including the United States. One thing we can note here is that irrespective of the classification changes, it appears that intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is increasing. It, start, it had a sharp increase here when it, uh, class skin was included as part of intrahepatic. When it was excluded, it dropped sharply, but then it went back again. Uh, extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, on the other hand, seems to be relatively stable. So there's increasing trend for intrahepatic and then relatively stable trend for extrahepatic malignancies. Now I want to, some investigators, after the introduction of ICD version 3, some investigators wanted to know the impact of the misclassification of class skin on incidence rates in the United States over the years. One group of investigators actually looked at CA data, surveillance epidemiology, and end results data from the National Cancer Institute. And what they did was look at a period between 1990 and 2000. And when they look at this period, they realized that 92% of all classing tumors were mis misdiagnosed, um, were misclassified as intrahepatic. And as a result of the misclassification, intrahepatic was overestimated in most studies by 13% while extrahepatic was underestimated by 15%. Another group of investigators actually look at a 40-year trend in cholangiocarcinoma in the United States. Uh, from 1973 to 2012, here, class skin was appropriately classified as extrahepatic malignancy. And what they found was that even after class, removing class skin from intrahepatic, intrahepatic continued to increase. They saw 128% increase in incidence in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma between 1973 to uh, 2012, whereas rates for extrahepatic remained relatively stable. So here is a table that actually shows the per, uh, annual percentage change in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma versus extrahepatic. What you can see is that each year within this period, Intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma increased by 2.3% uh, every year over the period between 1973 to 2012. Extrahepatic only increased by 0.14%. In the latter years, you see intrahepatic actually increased more significantly than extrahepatic uh, malignancy. And this is after class skin have been appropriately classified as extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. The take home message from the trends that we see is that Intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is increasing in the United States. Extrahepatic seems to be relatively stable. When you combine both intrahepatic with extrahepatic, cholangiocarcinoma as a whole is actually increasing in the United States. For more accurate and consistent assessment of the epidemiology of cholangiocarcinoma, most experts believe that it is now time to abandon the term class skin and then classify, standardize the classification of cholangiocarcinoma as intrahepatic perihyla or distal so that everybody will be coding it the exact same way that will make comparisons between uh, between studies much easier and across the globe very easy in the united states age and sex distribution of cholangiocarcinoma here we see that the disease is rarely diagnosed before age 40. specifically for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma the average age of diagnosis is 67. 
average age of diagnosis for extrahepatic is 72. On the graph here, you actually see that intrahepatic malignancies, which is in black, actually tend to be diagnosed at a, a much earlier age than extrahepatic malignancy. So we see 27% of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma diagnosed before age 60, whereas only 19% of extrahepatic is diagnosed before age 60. You compare to the uh, uh, latter ages of life, you see extrahepatic is more, uh, more commonly diagnosed uh, at the latter stages of life than intrahepatic. So the epidemiology of the disease actually is different. Age distribution, age at presentation is different. And we also see differences by sex where male seems to have higher incidence. The male to female ratio is anywhere between 1.2 to 1.5. Here we present stage distribution of cholangiocarcinoma in the United States. Comparing intrahepatic with extrahepatic malignancies. One thing we can see from this graph is that extrahepatic malignancies are presented at much earlier stages of the disease than intrahepatic. Whereas uh, extrahepatic, whereas intrahepatic are presented at a much later stage and extrahepatic are, are, are presented at a much earlier stage. So age, the stage of presentation is actually different between these two diseases and that should be considered in, when discussing epidemiology of cholangio. In terms of racial ethnic distribution, Hispanics seems to have my, higher incidence. They have about 31% higher incidence compared to non-Hispanics. In the graph below, we show distributions by race. We compare Blacks and Asians plus Pacific Islanders with whites. And what we see is that consistently, Asians seems to have higher incidence than whites, followed by Blacks. Incidence in Blacks are also significantly higher than uh, whites over the years. This is for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. We see a similar trend for extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So there's racial differences observed in the United States. In terms of the global context, United States rates in the United States are not much different from rates in other, other parts of the world. It is difficult to compare United States to any specific countries because the durations are slightly different. For example, in the United States, the estimate here is between 2003 to 2009, whereas in France it's from 76 to 2005. So we are not looking at the exact same periods. But one thing we can glean from this slide is that the rates are not the same across the globe. We seem to have much higher rates in Asian countries, particularly South Korea, China, and then Thailand. They seem to have much higher incidence rates than other parts of the world. So there is geographic differences in incidence across the globe, and this is likely due to differences in risk factors in different parts of the world. Factors such as aqua consumption, obesity rates, exercise, physical activity, uh, infectious infectious diseases, etc. They are all different. All the infections that affect cholangiocarcinoma they vary across the globe. So they may be driving the differences in incidence across various country, countries. On this slide, we present mortality rates across the globe, comparing United States to other parts of the world. And this is more easy to compare because you actually see the years are exactly the same. So when you take United States and Canada as an example, you can compare 2002 United States to that of Canada. It's not much different. The rates between United States and 2007 and 12 subsequent years are also not much different. One thing we can see in the U.S. is that Mortality rates from cholangiocarcinoma is increasing. It has been increasing consistently through, throughout uh, this period. We see similar trend in the UK and a similar trend in Germany as well. When you compare United States to the UK, for example, mortality rate seems to be slightly higher in the UK than the United States. Now I present some data on risk factors for cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, several risk factors have been examined, and usually you compare intrahepatic with extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And one thing we can see from this table is that some risk factors are unique to certain subtypes. So, for example, hemochromatosis is unique to intrahepatic but not extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. When you look at bile duct cyst, the very first one, you see that it is strongly, very strongly associated with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Is also very strongly associated with extrahepatic. So when you look at 
Caroline disease and then bowel duct cancers, they seem to have similar magnitude of risk for both intrahepatic and extrahepatic. But then there are some diseases where it's associated with only one cancer, but not the other. Not the other. The other thing I want to point out is that the magnitude of risk also varies, right? So when we take the viral infections, for example, hepatitis B, when we look at hepatitis B, it, it has a moderate to strong association with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, whereas he has a very weak association with extrahepatic. So the magnitude of risk is different. We see similar thing for chronic pancreatitis. It has a moderate association and strong associ uh, moderate association with intrahepatic and strong association with extrahepatic malignancy. We can see the same for uh, NAFLD and NASH, as well as asbestos exposure. The main point here is that magnitude of risk varies by tumor type and some risk factors are unique to certain subtypes of cholangiocarcinoma. This is an example of how the epidemiology of the two uh, uh, subtypes actually vary. So in summary, what we can see from the epidemiology of cholangiocarcinoma in the United States is that intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is actually increasing, whereas extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma remains relatively stable, similar to what has been described in the United Kingdom. Uh, overall, when we put those two groups together, overall, cholangiocarcinoma seems to be increasing in the United States. Uh, mortality rate seems to be uh, increasing in recent years. Most experts believe that we, it's about time we abandon the class, uh, CLAT skin classification to reduce confusion in how these diseases are coded and standardize cholangiocarcinoma as either, either inter, intrahepatic, perihyla, or distal cholangiocarcinoma. And I believe this will be implemented somewhere in 2021 when uh, ICD code for oncology version 4 is released. For future directions, studies that are interested in looking at the epidemiology of cholangiocarcinoma in the United States can address questions such as what is accounting for the rising incidence in the United States? Is it due to better diagnosis or increased prevalence of risk factors of cholangiocarcinoma? Another question that can be addressed is what are the trends in specific subgroups? Are the trends different in different age groups? Are they different in different racial groups? We can use this information to identify high risk group for close surveillance. The next factor that can be considered is clustering of cholangiocarcinoma in different parts of the US. Is cholangiocarcinoma clustered to a particular area? And what are the factors responsible for this clustering so that we can develop intervention strategies that specifically address those issues. I thank you very much for listening. So we will now have a live panel discussion. Please submit any questions that you have through the online chat. Um, I'd just like to start off uh, with, the, with the first question to, um, um, uh, to either of the uh, uh, presenters. Um, would you like to speculate on why we are seeing these increases in intrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinoma? Uh, well, I'll quickly pick up on that. Um, I, I think one factor will be that we're now more likely to identify uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma as a diagnosis. Um, picking up on the, the, the thread, um, uh, you, you heard even yesterday one of the, the patient uh, advocates was talking about um, following the diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma. She then underwent uh, upper GI and lower GI endoscopy to try and find a primary uh, because the oncologist thought this was a cancer of unknown primary. So I think we probably are finding more patients, in fact, who don't have cancer of unknown primary and have uh, an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. I think that improved diagnosis may account for a small increase. I think we do know that, in fact, there is an increase in liver disease generally uh, and increasing. Um, some people have talked about the, um, the liver epidemic uh, that, that is coming upon us. And that's really related not only to things like viral hepatitis, but in fact, more um, you know, fatty liver disease, obesity, metabolic syndrome. Mm -hmm. 
And we know that this is a risk factor both for HCC as well as cholangiocarcinoma. So uh, I think that uh, is also going to contribute quite uh, in, in quite a large way. Uh, and um, as the previous speaker said, we need to try and understand that a little bit better because we might be able to influence that and reverse some of that increased trend. I agree. I think it's a, it's a combination of improved diagnosis and also increase in risk factors. I think both may be contributing to it. Thank you. Um, so fatty liver disease, uh, just, to, just to follow up on what you mentioned, fatty liver disease is one of these, uh, um, uh, is a risk factor for many different types of cancer, um, uh, including hepatocellular cancer. Uh, but um, there have been few studies that have looked at it in cholangiocarcinoma. In your opinion, do you think um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a, is a risk factor for cholangiocarcinoma? I, I think that the evidence is pointing towards intrahepatic cholangio. It is not strong yet. We need to do more studies, but there's preliminary evidence that suggests that uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease may be associated with intrahepatic cholangio. We need uh, prospective studies with large numbers to be able to confirm that definitively. One of the questions from the um, audience is uh, uh, regarding um, the the mortality rates. And um, do do you have again? Would you care to speculate on why we why we're seeing increased mortality um, in the United States? Is this a function of uh, classification, um, or or is there a, a difference in the behavior of the cancer? I'll go first. I think that it kind of parallels the incidence rates, right? As incidence is going, mortality is, is going. So improved incidence may be one of the reasons why we are observing, and that can be a factor of the classification. We are, we've been better at diagnosing it, I think, in the latter years than the previous year. So yes, classification, better diagnosis, improve incidence all are contributing to it. If I were to guess, I think that the higher incidence in the latter years perhaps may play a much role, a much significant role in it. Yeah, and I agree with that. Just to add to that, uh, unfortunately at the moment we know that uh, most patients where uh, a diagnosis is made of cholangiocarcinoma, and I'm thinking across the whole range from intrahepatic through to extrahepatic as well, uh, unfortunately a diagnosis where disease is, is not amenable to major surgery to cure it. Um, the surgery is pro probably possible in, in a minority of patients. So um, then when we do have an increase in incidence, that will be reflected in an in in increase in, in mortality. Uh, and what we're trying to do, obviously, is to improve early diagnosis, uh, surgery, improving adjuvant treatments, all of which will really improve survival, as well as in patients with advanced disease, obviously trying to and get better systemic therapies to improve survival. But I think the main improvement in survival once a cancer has developed is going to be with a focus on prevention, early diagnosis, um, uh, surgery, and adjuvant treatment. Thank you. Um, uh, you focused on, on Europe and the United States, uh, but uh, we, um, we also have a fairly um, high incidence of cholangiocarcinoma in, in um, Asian countries. Uh, would you care to just comment on, on that? Yes, yeah, so, so uh, un unfortunately, uh, we were not able to have a speaker from Asia at, at the conference, uh, but we know that the incidence is um, a magnitude greater than it is in the rest of the world. Um, there are certain hotspots where the um, cause causality is very specific and different to what we see elsewhere. So, for example, in Northeast Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, places like that, um, there is cholangiocarcinoma associated with uh, liver fluke. Um, and this is uh, something that's ingested. It's, uh, it's a tartar fish type meal, um, which then unfortunately leaves a liver fluke within the liver, which causes inflammation over a number of years, maybe even two or three decades. Um, but that is um, causing a large um, number of cases of, of uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. 
and the team at uh, Konkan University and others in, in, in Thailand are really leading on uh, trying to improve uh, public health. Uh, and again, prevention there is going to be better, uh, but also instituting um, a surveillance program using ultrasound to identify patients who've developed cholangiocarcinoma, again, thinking about early surgery. Um, that, that is not something that's seen outside of uh, the Mekong River Delta um, uh, in, in, in Europe or, or US. So it is a very different, uh, different disease, uh, still called cholangiocarcinoma, but it's caused by a different causative agent. Thank you. Um, there's some questions that have uh, been uh, brought up about uh, genetic causes. Um, how important do you think genetic um, causes are uh, for cholangiocarcinoma? Um, so, so I've seen a few questions on the um, uh, on, on the chat. I, I think really what we're talking about are mutations within uh, cancer. You heard on the the earlier video we should be talking now about biomarkers um, rather than mutations. Um, but but the idea is that ra rather than describing cholangiocarcinoma as multiple diseases based on anatomy, uh, we're now much more aware that, in fact, there are molecular subgroups um, of, of, um, of patients with cholangiocarcinoma, uh, where a particular mutation seems to be driving uh, the development of the cancer. Um, again, you heard uh, earlier on from somebody um, who was um, on ibocitinib for an uh, IDH1 mutation. Uh, so that's one group. Another group are patients with FGFR2 mutations, and I'm sure you'll hear more about that uh, later in the meeting. And then there are uh, other rarer ones, like NTRAC, for example, is another a rare mutation, uh, which happens in less than 1% of patients with cholangiocarcinoma. But if that individual's patient has that mutation, then it may be possible to use a treatment specifically targeting that mutation. Yeah. And, and I'm also aware, so he described the rare mutations, uh, uh, variants that causes cholangiocarcinoma, and I'm aware that there's an ongoing effort to identify the more common variants that we usually identify through genome-wide association studies. I think later today there's a presentation on that. There is an effort to identify some of the co common variants that may be contributing to, to risk. So those interested may want to pay attention and, and, and attend that session. I think it will be very helpful. Thank you. There's a question about uh, asbestos as a, as a risk factor, and I think I'll, I'll just make a comment um, on that, so I'm not, not asking all the questions. Uh, there have been several cohort studies that have uh, um, suggested an increased risk of liver cancers in general with uh, exposure to asbestos, and uh, at least two case control studies that I'm aware of that have shown a link between asbestos uh, exposure and, and cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, but I don't think we really uh, know what the underlying cause uh, is um, or how this might be related to an increased um, uh, uh, risk of cancer in the, in the biliary tract is at this point. So I think we're coming up to the end of our time. I just want to again close by uh, thanking the, the, the presenters uh, for their excellent presentations and, um, and for uh, all of the attendees for their, uh, for their questions and time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.